Good morning, Berkeley Chapel. You guys doing all right this morning? It's good to be with you. Thank you, Pastor Dave, so much for those kind words. I love you too. It's, a, it's an honor to be able to serve here uh, every single week. I get up and thank the Lord for being able to do the job that I get to do. It's a wonderful, uh, wonderful just blessed and honored uh, experience that I get to live. I thank God for it every day. And so I'm thankful to be here with you guys. Today I've been stirring over this message for quite a while that, uh, that I believe that the Lord has given me for you. And, uh, you know, part of it is about revival. Uh, part of it is about worship. But all of it is about being fully devoted to Jesus Christ as a follower. And so if you would, would you just bow your heads with me just for a moment as I pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I just thank you, Lord, so much once again in the second service, Lord, to have the opportunity to speak your word. I pray, Lord, that, um, God, that I go ahead and take the reins that are in my hand and give them to you, Lord. I ask that you take the lead on this. This is not my message, Lord, but yours. Let it be yours, God. And just, I just pray that you anoint my lips for your service. Uh, purify my heart, uh, purify the hearts of this congregation, that we may receive your word, that it may affect us, that it may change us and transform us to be more like you. In Jesus' name I pray. Everybody said, amen. amen. And so uh, I'd like to read and start out from a passage in the book of Amos. This is a prophet of God. Listen to the words of the Lord through the prophet Amos. I hate... Verse 21. That's the way to start out a message right there, okay? Words. I hate. All right, but listen to this. L listen to what God says. I hate. I despise your feast days, and I do not savor your sacred assemblies. Though you offer me burnt offerings and your grain offerings, I will not accept them, nor will I regard your fattened peace offerings. Take away from me the noise of your songs. For I will not hear the melody of your stringed instruments. But let justice run down like water and righteousness like a mighty stream. Those are the words of the Lord. God has always been after people's hearts. Always been after people's hearts. Now, that's not to say that the physical side of things doesn't matter because it does. What we do physically and what we carry out in our lives, it obviously matters. It makes a difference to God. That's why we talk so much about holiness and, you know, and purification, the way we live our lifestyle. It matters to God. But God is specifically focused on our hearts. What gets his attention is not that organ that's beating in your chest, by the way, but it's a symbol of the inner place of you. The real you, the you underneath that flesh, the you that you are, the place where you make your decisions from, the place where your emotions are created. You know, in English, we use that as, hey, hey, do you have heart or not? You know, when it comes to the field, what heart is all about? It's the same thing biblically. What is God looking at? That, your heart. God has always been focused on that. In this passage in the book of Amos, that was, it was basically spoken over the Israelites at a period of time where they were so caught up in going through the motions of worship that they forgot what worship was all about. Their hearts were corrupted. They didn't really want to serve God, but they were kind of you know, going through the motions. They were still singing songs. They were still making sacrifices. They were still assembling together. Why? Because they were checking off the boxes of the things that they thought that they needed to do. But their gatherings were dry bones. There was no heart in their gatherings. And it didn't please God. There was nothing to it but mere tradition. And worse, even worse than that, hypocrisy. Their half-hearted behavior made God puke. You know, in the book of Revelation, Jesus writes letters to the churches. Of course, it's the revelation of Jesus to the Apostle John. Don't forget that. Jesus is speaking to the churches, and to one of them he says, 
you guys, it's what we call the lukewarm church. And he speaks to them. He says, I wish that you were hot or that you were cold. But you guys are in the middle. You're lukewarm. And that makes me sick. It makes me vomit. It makes me throw up. Now, I actually threw up yesterday. So I'm going to share this story, okay? Uh, and I didn't throw up because of the church. <laughs> but I threw up because... I did CrossFit, and I learned you shouldn't eat a pound of pulled pork after you get done doing that. So, you know, so poor Victoria, my wife, she's, uh, she's like, what's wrong with you? And, of course, it was a mess. And I remember that feeling, you know. You can't, you can't be on staff here at Berkeley Chapel and be under Pastor Dave if you don't do CrossFit, all right? You can't be around Pastor Dave too long without being convicted to do CrossFit. And so, uh, but I remember that feeling that I had just before I threw up. You know, not to be super graphic, okay, because what a day you came to church on, right? Um, but when you have, if you've ever been through that experience, it's horrible, man. The feeling of disgust that you have right before it happens is terrible. My poor wife, the first like three months of being pregnant, by the way, we're like going on almost 39 weeks, you guys. All right, the next time you see me, I might be uh, holding my little girl. So, um, but keep praying for Victoria. She wanted to be here this morning, but she's on that last stretch. So she's watching from online right now. But I remember even her, I mean, for the first few months of being pregnant, oh my gosh, every day, a couple times a day. And those of you moms, anybody a mom out there, you probably have been through some of that. I feel for you. I felt so terrible for her. Think about that feeling right before the disgust. And let me tell you, that's how God feels about half-hearted Christianity, about half-hearted devotion. What God requires out of us is what he's always required out of anyone who's ever been a part of his kingdom, anyone who's ever been a part of following him, period. He asks us for full-hearted devotion and nothing less than that. It does not mean that you are going to be perfect, by the way, because guess what? There's not a perfect person in this room, including me, definitely. I'm chief among the sinners in this room. And the reality is you won't be perfect, but that's not what God has asked you. He didn't ask you to be perfect because that would be an unachievable goal. What he asked you for is full-hearted, complete devotion to him. I love the, uh, the Psalms. Anybody read the Psalms? All right, you know, King David wrote most of the Psalms. And this was a man, this was a servant of God that when God pointed him out, anointed him to be king through the prophet Samuel, what he said about David is so profound. He said, you, are, you guys are looking at the outward appearance and, 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 and thinking about that. But for me, I choose him because I'm looking at the heart. I see the inside. I know the real you. You know, you can't fake God, like fake him out. You can't bribe him. You can't pretend with him. He sees right through the mask every single time. He knows the real you, whether that's good or bad. He knows who you are. You cannot fake him. And what is he looking for in you? What does he require out of you? He requires a heart fully devoted to him. He requires full surrender to that church that Jesus spoke to. He says, you guys are, you know, I wish you were hot or you're cold. The problem is, is you're just in the middle somewhere. It's like, you know, I've been made up your mind. You know, you seem to be kind of following me, but then you really don't follow me. You kind of seem like you come to church, but then you really don't live like a Christian. Whatever the case is for them, it made God vomit. And we see the same kind of element here in Amos. I hate, I despise your feast days. I mean, that's strong language. But this is just as much of a sobering message for me in 2022 as it was for Israel in the days of Amos. We can never forget that God demands our full-hearted devotion. We can never forget that God demands complete obedience to him. He said obedience is better than sacrifice. You know, Israelites used to sacrifice. That was part of worship. 
You know, a lot of the symbolism behind an altar is that of sacrifice. We come here, we sacrifice too, but we do it spiritually. We give ourselves up. You know, coming to Jesus, a moment of coming to Jesus, you sacrifice, you give yourself up, you give your life away to him. That's what that's about. But in the process of doing that, what this, I mean, if you think about it, if you let this linger for a moment on your mind, you really just dwell on this for a second, the whole aspect of following God from beginning to end is about full, utter, complete surrender to him. Full devotion. You're either as far as he is concerned, 100% in or 100% out. There is no middle. It did not require perfection. To be 100% in does not mean you're perfect because anybody who says they're perfect is not perfect because they're lying. <laughs> All right? Let's get that straight. But your heart, what God is looking at, what God observes of you, your heart, is either 100% in or was 100% out. We can never forget that. And in that conversation, if you just want to note this down in your notes for a moment, I want to give you the law of the minimum and the maximum. All right? So if you want, just find a place there in your phone or in your notes and jot down just the law of the minimum and the law of the maximum. The law of the minimum asks... What is the minimum requirement for a passing grade? What do I have to do? How much can I get away with and still get to heaven? That's the law of the minimum, okay? Uh, I'll be honest, all right, among the people in this room. I have asked that question before in my life, all right? I'm guilty of that. How much do I have to do to still get in to heaven? All right, how much can I get away with? How little do I have to do to still be a Christian, that is the law of the minimum. You know, we fight over those kinds of things. Even in seminaries and stuff, so much of the discussion and the things that we fight about is about the minimum requirement. What do you have to do just to be saved? But that tells us where our, our heart is. The law of the minimum. But listen to the law of the maximum. The law of the maximum asks, what's the most I can give to God in this life? What is the max I can get out of this relationship with him? I do not want to miss out on one single thing that God has for me. I don't want to miss out on one gift that he has for me. Tell me, how far does this road go with Jesus? Because I want to go all the way. Tell me, what more can I give? What more can I give up? Tell me to give up my life. And, you know, what's beautiful is like the Apostle Paul. If you read those letters, you know what he says? He says, take my life. If I were to be able to die for the sake of Christ, then I count it joy. Why? Because my life, I gave it up a long time ago. It's not mine anymore. I already gave it to him. And if he decides to take it or he decides to do whatever he wants with it, that's his decision. Because my life is in full surrender. That is what it looks like to live by the law of the maximum. That is what it looks like to live a life fully devoted David lived a life like that. You know, David was not a perfect person. He has, his life is open before us to read in the Bible. He was a man of God, but oh my gosh, he had utter, complete failures. He had sinful habits. He had issues to work through in his life. Just go back and read his story and, you know, adultery, murder, different things that David experienced. And you would wonder, how could God pick someone like that. But let me tell you about David. God blessed that man. He blessed generations after him, his children and grandchildren, and way down the line because of how much he loved David. And why? Because David was a man after God's own heart. Because David was a man fully devoted. He didn't live perfectly. He couldn't live perfectly. None of us can live perfectly. What he did is he was a man living fully all in, man. I'm going to mess up, and I'm going to mess up big. That's why you can't put your faith in a pastor. But I'm going to live my life fully devoted. You put your faith in God, by the way. That's what I meant by that. David lived a life 
of devotion to God. You can read it in his Psalms. It's beautiful to listen to and to think of that because that is what pleases God. And that's what God requires out of us, to live lives based on the law of the maximum. Not how much can I get away with, not how little do I have to come to church to still be a Christian. That's the wrong question. Should never even be asking that question. The question is how much can you give to God? You're not gonna be at church every single Sunday. No, I mean, except unless your name is Miss Shelby, all right? Because in Auburndale, she's been in church every Sunday. We'll give her that, all right? But Miss Shelby's a longtime member of this church for decades, like 50 years. But what has God required of you? Full hearted devotion. That's what? Not perfection. God sees your heart before him. If you're just doing the minimum from his perspective, you can keep it. He says, hey, you can keep your your minimum because that's not what I'm looking for. Looking back at that passage in Amos, just think of the parallel to us. If you're giving God just the minimum, you're just checking off boxes, just singing, just to sing, just attending, just to attend, just walking, just to walk with no heart, nothing in it, half-hearted devotion toward God. What does he say? He says, you can keep that. Save it. I don't want that. God deserves our best. God deserves our heart. And in fact, that's what he demands. Jesus is going to consume you if you follow him. He's not going to ask you for just part of you. He's not going to, there is not going to be one single area. Listen, listen to me and when I say this. This is the total truth. There's not going to be one single area of your life that Jesus doesn't affect if you follow him the way that he wants you to. Your job will be affected. Your sexuality will be affected. The way you treat your body will be affected. The way you treat your wife will be affected. The way you raise your kids will be affected. Every single aspect, the way you think will be affected. Every aspect, every facet and fiber of your being and of your life will be affected because Jesus wants all that. When he said that he's coming to, you know, to to give your life to him, he meant give it completely to him. That's full-hearted devotion, full-hearted surrender. And God accepts nothing less than that. That's it. We learn to do that, though, as we walk with God. We learn to keep that. Now, I get the battle of uh, the daily grind. You know, uh, in life, sometimes you don't feel like coming to church, but you get up and you come anyways because that's part of what it means to be devoted. I get the battle of the daily grind. Sometimes you don't feel like reading your Bible, but you read it. Sometimes you don't really feel like getting on your knees, but you get on your knees. That's the battle of the daily grind. But let me tell you, the battle of the daily grind is no problem whenever your drive and your motivation is in the right place. You see, uh, doing CrossFit again, okay, with Pastor Dave, one of the things you'll notice about trying to keep your body in shape is you don't really feel like going to the gym a lot of the time. In fact, you look at the workout, and that's the problem with CrossFit, is they put the workout in front of you, and you got to know what you're going into to basically torment you for an hour, okay? But you get there, and you do it, and that's the daily grind, man. But what, why you do it is because you have this inner motivation, this inner desire, this, this desire, that, how I want to take care of my body. My body is a temple. I want, to, I want to treat it well. The battle of a daily grind is real, but it's no problem if your motivation is in the right place. With Jesus, no problem. You're going to want to read your Bible if you're following Jesus with a fully devoted heart because you're going to want to know. Let me tell you, this book right here, I'm devoting my life to studying this book right now. I'm still in school studying this book because I want to know everything that I can possibly learn about this book. I mean, I'm basing my life off of it. Like, I'm going to raise my daughter based off of what this book says. I want to know it. Don't you? When your motivation is in the right place, the daily grind is no problem. Why wouldn't you? You say you're a Christian, you're a believer. Man, read the Bible, because you're going to base your whole life off of what that book says. It's huge. But human beings have incredible trouble with this. We really do. 
We have incredible trouble staying focused and committed to God. You can see it in the course of history with Israel especially, and you can see it in our lives as well. We go up and down in terms of our commitment to God, and this is the way that it looks. If you look at the story of Israel, you'll see Israel starts out uh, as a nation in the book of Exodus. They are a people, very numerous, but in slavery down here. There are people in slavery. Now, I know that the board is a little hard to see. It looked huge in the back in the office. I brought it in here in this little big room. So I'm going to try to be very animate in my preaching to show you, okay? All right? So just hang in there with me. There are people in slavery, and they cry out to God, God, rescue us. Please help us. And what does he do? He, he, he does. He sends his servant Moses. They're rescued, 10 plagues and all that. And then the story goes, they get freedom. They get freedom. God saves them. He delivers them from the land of Egypt. But guess what? We'll come back to this later because I won't spend too much time on it now. But through a couple decisions of some huge faithlessness, disobedience on their part, they, had, uh, they were supposed to go straight to the promised land. But in fact, because of their disobedience, they drop all the way down here and they go to the wilderness for 40 years. And then God has, says, but you know what? I'm not giving up on you. I'm going to bring you to the promised land that I told you about, that, I, that you know, I, I committed that. We had a covenant and agreement. I'm going to do it. So he takes them from the wilderness, and he brings them to the promised land through a servant named Joshua, a wonderful leader. But then the rest of the Bible, or the rest of the Old Testament, is sort of this continuous spiral downward, this pattern that little by little, and sometimes big jumps, the people of Israel rebel against God, disobey, and there's a couple little jags, like, you know, it's kind of like the stock market line, like you see some jags in there, like you have little revivals, you know, you get, you get David, you get Hezekiah, you get Josiah, you got periods, you get the prophets, but for the most part, Israel is on their way down. Why? Because perpetual disobedience, and they end up coming down, and they go to exile, God says, you know what, I brought you to my land. I made you my people. I called you my own. I gave you my spirit. I'm with you, and yet you want to go serve other gods. You're not devoted to me. And after centuries and centuries, finally God gave them into exile. He said, I'm going to give you what you want. This is the story of the Bible, by the way, ups and downs. This is the pattern of Israel. But then in God's grace, I mean, Aren't you grateful for God's grace? Anybody in here? In God's grace, he revives them. He speaks through the prophets and he says, I'm going to send you a king. I'm going to gather you from all the places you've been exiled, all the scattered parts of the earth. I'm going to gather you back together. I'm going to give you a Messiah, an anointed one, and he's going to lead you and guide you. And through this pattern of ups and downs, ups and downs, finally we get to Jesus. But this pattern also looks a lot like our lives. Our lives go up and down in terms of commitment sometimes with God. I mean, if you think about it, even after Jesus came, the church was no different than Israel. The first 300 years of the church, they're on fire for God. I mean, they're literally, that's where the martyr stories come from. There were no church buildings They didn't have places like this to meet in. They met in people's houses, 20 and 30 people at a time. If it was a mega church, a huge church in a place like Ephesus or Rome, then it would have been maybe 100 people. But the church nevertheless was thriving. It was vibrant. It was amazing and growing like crazy rapid rate. It swept the globe. But after 300 years, guess what happened? They they legalized Christianity. We institutionalized the church. We got to the point where we stopped giving full-hearted devotion and commitment. And then finally, God brought up some reformers, Martin Luther, John Calvin. Remember those guys? That's where we come from. Because those guys, they, they were like, something's wrong here. We're not doing it the way that we're supposed to be doing it. We're not fully devoted to God. We're doing things we're not even supposed to be doing. Are you kidding me? Having people pay money for their sins? That was why they did what they did. They called those indulgences and they, left, they, they were thrown out of the Catholic Church, and then they reformed, and then we came from that. But guess what? Even since then, if we're not careful, 
we will have a tendency toward disobedience, toward complacency, toward all that stuff. Revival is important for our lives. In my life, I keep a little chart. It has four levels, and it looks like a pyramid. On the bottom level, it's just a reminder for me. I put spirit. Because if your spirit is not healthy, then nothing's going to be healthy, man. Because if you're not connected to God's heart, then you're missing out on the whole purpose for which you were created. So I put spirit on the bottom. And then I have a mind. Because I want to be a forever learner, you know. I want to always be growing. And then I put body, because you can't work for Pastor Dave and not do CrossFit. So I put spirit, mind, body, because we take care of our body. But now that sounds pretty familiar, spirit, mind, body. We have, it's pretty common. But this fourth level is, it is, is something different. And for me, on the fourth one, I put revival. Why? Because I know me. I know that I have a tendency to be complacent, to get lazy with God. I know that I have a tendency to be going through the motions but not be meaning it with all my heart. And so what that word revival does for me is it reminds me of this. It reminds me that in my life, I need to keep the fire burning. I need to be reminded again of what God has done in my life and how he wants to continue to do it. And I believe he wants the same for you. In closing, I turn to a passage in Deuteronomy chapter 1, which is happening in this phase when Israel is there in the wilderness. They spent 40 years in the wilderness, and there they were, numbered like the stars of heaven. Moses gets up and he stands in front of them. He's 120 years old. Been through all that they've been through. And he stands up and he says, you guys are about to go into the promised land. All this time that we've been waiting on, you're about to go there. He says, but if you want to know why we're not there right now, I'm going to tell you. And then he begins to recount the story. Tells them about how they came out of Egypt through the Red Sea. God delivered them. He brought them to receive the Ten Commandments. And then right then, immediately, he brought them to the land. And he said, and this is where we went wrong. We were there at the land at the very beginning. And God said, go in and possess it. Receive it. It's yours. I've already given it to you. Past tense. He's already done it. All you got to do is just walk it out. But then we hesitated. And we stood there on that ground and then we said, hey, I don't think we can just go in like that. Let's get some people together. Let them go in, go check it out, see who's there, see what the land looks like, if it's really a place we want to go, and then we'll go. Moses agrees, and he picks 12 guys representing each of the 12 tribes. They're 12 best guys, probably. Among them, Joshua and a man named Caleb. And those 12 guys go into the land and spy it out. They go check it all out. This is in your notes. It's all there in your little handout, Deuteronomy chapter 1. They go check it out, and this is what they see. They go there, and they're like, oh, my goodness. This land is like God said it was. It's got fruit. It's beautiful. I mean, they were taking truckloads of fruit back practically because it was so cool. But then they saw something. They looked, and they saw giants in the land. And they saw what the Bible calls fortified cities with impenetrable walls. Places that a group of slaves could never imagine conquering. Giants that they could, I mean, they were not people trained in war. They came out of Egypt as slaves. They didn't even have weapons for the most part. And they're looking at these giants and thinking, there's no way. There's no way. We can do this. And so they go back to the people, and this is basically what happens. Now, I'm going to read mine from a parallel account in the book of Numbers because it says it just a little differently, and I want you to see it. Verse 27 in chapter 13 of Numbers, it says, Then they told him and said, We went to the land where you sent us. It truly flows with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. Nevertheless, the people who dwell in the land are strong. The cities are fortified and very large. 
Moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak there. Those are the people like we say that Goliath actually probably came from. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south, the Hittites, the Jet, all these people groups all over the place dwelling in the land. Like, man, there's people everywhere. And they're not just like your everyday guys. These guys are strong. They'll smash us. Verse 30, I love it. Listen to this. Then Caleb, one of those 12 spies, quieted the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and take possession for we are well able to overcome it. How many of you are thankful for that one faithful person who's willing to stand up and say the word of God if nobody else will? That was Caleb. But the men who had gone up with him said, we're not able to go up against the people for they're stronger than we. And they gave the children of Israel a bad report about the land which they had spied out, saying the land through which we've gone as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants. They're fear-mongering now. And all the people whom we saw in it are men of great stature. There we saw giants. The descendants of Anak came from the giants. And we were like grasshoppers in their sight and in our own. What did they do there? They said, we know this promise of God, but there's no way they wouldn't go after that Moses tells them well hey don't be afraid Joshua stands up too as well he says don't be afraid just like God has done in the times past he's never failed before he brought us out of Egypt and he'll do it again but for all that they would not believe They would not go. They were the generation that would not move. What generation do you want to be? What do you want to be known as in your life? I don't want to be known as that generation. The generation that would not move. You know what God says to them? There at the end of Deuteronomy, it says, And the Lord heard the sound of your words, and he was angry. And he took an oath, saying, Surely not one of these men of this evil generation shall see the good land which I swore to give to your fathers, except for Caleb. He shall see it, and to him and his children I'm going to give the land which he walked, because he wholly followed the Lord. The Lord was also angry with me for your sakes. And Moses even saying, You got me in trouble. Out here as your leader, because we didn't go. God continues to go on. He even says, even, he said, but here's the deal. Your little ones, the children who you said would become captive if we went into that land, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take them, and they're going to go. And y'all are going to miss it. You're going to get skipped, but they're going to go. Because when God speaks a promise, it's sure. You know, Hebrews 6, 19, it says that we have this hope. It's sure. When the Bible talks about hope, it's not like we do. We say, man, I hope I get a sandwich today, and maybe you won't. You know what I mean? (laughs) Maybe you will, maybe you won't. But in the Bible, hope is not like that. In the Bible, when it says my hope is in the Lord, it means my hope is sure. My hope is 100%. I I may not see it yet, but my hope, I know it's going to be there. Man, after this life, I hope I go to heaven, but it's not, because I don't, it's not because I'm on the fence. It's because I know I'm going to heaven. That's the emphasis of that word hope in the scripture. You see, when God told them to go into the land, he said, you're going. One of the things that I think is important for us to do, even in this service together as we close this service out, is to think in your heart, what do you really believe about God? What generation do you want to be? Do you want to be that person that is more focused on what CNN is saying and Fox News and all these news channels are saying rather than what the Word of God is saying? Or do you want to be someone who says, man, 
I don't care what's culturally trendy. I don't care what's going around right now. I don't care what people are saying right now. What I care about is what this book says. And what this book says is that my God is good, that my hope is secure, that after this life there's something greater. And what this book says is that you can be free. I want to live my life like that. And you can too. This man, Caleb, was a bold guy. Him and Joshua. I told you earlier, Joshua was end up, he was the guy that brought the people into the land. And that was part of the reason why, because he was faithful. But Caleb, I don't know if you caught it when I read it, but this is what it says about him. In verse 36 there, it says, except for Caleb, he shall see it. And to him and his children, I'm going to give the land that he walked. Why? There's a big reason why right there, you guys. It ties this whole thing together with a bow. Because he wholly followed the Lord. Because he completely, utterly followed the Lord. When giants stood in the way, it didn't stop that guy. When cities were in the way, it didn't stop that guy. He wholly, completely, utterly surrendered his life to God. And he said, God, whatever you say, that's what I'm going to do. Whatever stands in the way, if it means I'm the only one left in my nation that's going to claim your word, then I'll be the one to shout it. If it means that I'm the only one left, God, who believes, then I'm going to be that one. Tell you what, I'm grateful for people like that. In this generation, I believe God wants to do something special. Why not us is the question I have. Why not you? Did you know that God has a plan for your life? He loves you. He died for you. He gave himself for you. And he didn't do that so you can sit on a pew every Sunday and check off boxes. That's great you're coming to church. But, you know, he wants to do something more. He wants to do something bigger than you can imagine. If you'll fully surrender your life to him and never look back, let me tell you, it'll be a ride like you've never experienced before. What does God want from you? He doesn't want to take you off the streets just to get you off the streets. He wants to take you off the streets to equip you and fill you with his spirit, to put you back on the street so you can reach people for his name. That's what he wants to do. What does he require out of us? Full-hearted surrender, full-hearted obedience. Give your life to him, man, and you'll never regret it. If nobody else stands up, you be a Joshua. You be like Caleb. God honors that. Who in this generation? Why not us? Why not Berkeley Chapel? What does God want to do in this city? What does God want to do in our local schools? I'm so excited to be going to FCA at our local schools. I got, we're in Lena Vista now. We're in Stambaugh. We're, in, we're about to get into Auburndale High School, hopefully, as this door uh, just continues to open up. It's exciting. I dream of just revival taking place on those campuses. God just taking over over there. Just starting a movement of students who would be able to open up their hearts to God. Why not us? Why not you? Who are you? Who do you really want to be remembered for being? I don't want to be that generation that has to forever be like, man, I'm the generation that got skipped. I'm the generation that wouldn't go when God said go. I'm the generation that held back when I knew I should have gave more. I want to live by the law of the maximum that says, God, whatever you ask from me, whatever you allow me to give, I'm going to give it. Whatever you put in front of me, I'm going to step into that. I don't know if I even see a step there, but I'm going to step. And whenever I land, I know you're going to have something under my feet. If you call me, I'll go. Who are you? Who are you on the inside? What is your heart? Do you want to live a life fully devoted to God? And if that's you, I want to give you an opportunity. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me for a moment?